state, nation, government? Can you explain the differences in these terms that are very similar? It's challenging, isn't it? But today's session will help you get it all figured out. You ready? Come join me. Let's compare. So what are we going to learn today? Let's start by talking about our agenda for the 45 minutes that we have together. First, we're gonna address some of the questions that you submitted yesterday. Thank you to all of you that submitted some feedback, some suggestions, some questions, uh, and even some drafts of your FRQ questions. I'm gonna give you some feedback on all of that in just a moment. We're gonna be focusing on unit one today, and we're gonna review some of that key vocabulary that you need to know in unit one, especially focusing on the differences between a regime, a state, a government, and a nation. As part of that, we'll also review differences between democratic and authoritarian regimes and federal and unitary system. And we'll end our session today with some practice source analysis, multiple choice questions. One, a quantitative question, and then one, a text-based qualitative session. But to begin with, I would like to give uh, some feedback and answer some of the questions that uh, you submitted yesterday. And I wanna begin with a few important shout outs. I'd like to give a shout out to Mrs. Rommel's uh, first Bell AP Comparative Government class at Goshen High School in Ohio. Good luck to you guys as you're preparing for the exam. And also to Mrs. Bond's AP Comparative Government class. Thank you guys. And if anybody else would like a shout out, uh, please submit the Google form uh, that you'll have access to uh, at the end of today's session. Now, several of you submitted some excellent questions based on what we talked about yesterday in our time together. So I want to respond to a few of those. If I don't get to all of your questions today, we'll work them into our later sessions. So one question that we received is how many stimulus-based multiple choice questions can you expect to see? What a great question. So you are likely to see three different sets of two to three quantitative based questions. Uh, so three different data uh, sources, and then there will be a series of either two to three questions on each of those three data sets. And then as far as the text-based or qualitative multiple choice questions, you're likely to see two sets, again, with two to three questions per set. So there are more questions, many more questions, uh, about 40 to 44 questions that will not uh, be, be stimulus-based. Uh, the reason I've been focusing on the stimulus-based ones is those are often the ones that students struggle with more and that they need a little more practice. Uh, so that's why we spent a little time looking at those in our first two sessions together and we'll look at uh, some more of those questions today. Um, Another question, I had several questions about the data analysis that we focused on yesterday. Student asked a great question of if a data set has an outlier, yeah, something that stands out, is that something you should mention or acknowledge in your answer? Well, it really depends on what the prompt has asked of you. If the prompt has asked you to identify a pattern or trend. In general, I would say don't talk about the outlier. Uh, talk about the pattern and trend and use the data to back that up. Unless you feel like there is a circumstance where you really need to explain that this trend exists despite that outlier. But my advice to you is focus on the prompt. Uh, and unless the prompt uh, somehow requires you to reference that, I, I would stick to the patterns or trends that you identify rather than focusing on the outliers. Uh, another question that I received about sort of data analysis FRQs, uh, a question of if you are not asked to describe a pattern uh, in a graph, should you still describe it? Um, it kind of depends here on exactly what's being asked by that question. If you are not asked at all to identify a pattern or a trend, then no, you shouldn't talk about it. You want to answer the prompt. But if what, what this question was asking at is if the task verb is identify, 
should you still use some of the data from the graph to back it up? And my answer to that would be yes. Uh, even if the task verb is identify, I, I would still back it up with what you are seeing in that graph or chart or table. Um, and if uh, anybody needs to ask follow-up questions to these, put them in the Google form and Mrs. Bailey or I will follow up with those. Um, another question that I got again with that, that data analysis that we worked on yesterday, when you are asked to describe a pattern, do you analyze it for a specific portion of the data or generalize uh, for the whole set of data? It totally depends on what the prompt asks you. The prompt we looked at yesterday, you know, asked for one country in narrow period. So you're just going to want to talk. Uh, uh, you're going to want to talk across the whole period that the prompt asks. Uh, so look at the prompt carefully and analyze and look for trends across that time period that's been given to you. So I sound a little redundant here, but it really depends on how the prompt is worded and what it's asking you to do. Stick as close to what that is saying uh, as possible. Um, so here's a couple of just side questions that I got not related to the data analysis, but I can answer them real quick because I'm trying to hit as many of your good questions as I can. Uh, can you write in cursive uh, if you're doing the paper and pencil exam? Yes, you can. Please always make sure whatever style of writing you're using that it is as legible as possible uh, so that it is easier to read and that you can get as much credit as you have earned uh, through the points that there's not questions about what you're saying. Um, and a question about can you use abbreviations? Um, it, I, it sort of depends on what, uh, if, you, you know, a, a little symbol for the word and I believe is what one student asked, could you use that? Sure, if that's saving you time, um, there's nothing harmful for that. Um, could you use abbreviations like for party names, like use PRI for pre or PAN rather than writing out those party names? Absolutely, save yourself time. But any abbreviation you use, make sure it is an abbreviation that is well known and not just some sort of short abbreviation you have come up with uh, as shorthand. It needs to be an abbreviation that would be well known in the study of comparative government and politics and the, uh, you know, the content of the countries that we've been studying. So those were just a few of the questions that I got that I wanted to address. We'll continue to address some of the others that I am not going to get to right now. And you guys asked for more country specific examples, more FRQ practice, a little more focus on Iran and continuing to emphasize those task verbs. So we're going to make sure that Mrs. Bailey and I continue to do that. And please continue to provide us with feedback on what you most need uh, during these review sessions for us. Before we move on to our topics for today, um, I want to just briefly talk about this FRQ, which was the practice FRQ that I gave you yesterday. And quite a few of you uh, submitted them via the Google Doc. Uh, and I can't give you individual feedback because it's anonymous. I don't know exactly who you are, uh, but I wanted to give some general feedback and I wanted to clarify something uh, about this FRQ. So the purpose of using this FRQ was to practice that skill of data analysis. That was really our focus yesterday was on the skill. But I do want to make sure you understand the data analysis FRQ that you will see on the exam will be worth five points, uh, not six points. When we looked at this rubric yesterday, it was worth six points. And that confused uh, a couple of people. So I did want to clear that up. The purpose of this was just for the practicing that skill. Know that you will see um, a slightly different rubric. Uh, you will see a five point rubric uh, and an A, B, C, D, E format on this year's exam. Um, so did want to clear that up, but it's still the skill. We need as much practice with that skill as we can. Now, to give you some brief general feedback, uh, I did read everybody who submitted a, a sample FRQ to me. I read it and man, uh, you have some excellent teachers and you are very good writers. I was quite impressed with the quality uh, that I saw from the ones that were submitted. But I want to give a couple of general uh, suggestions for improvement. Uh, that I saw overall. It may not apply to your specific submission, but uh, I saw this as sort of as a pattern that emerged as I was viewing these. First off, um, whenever you 
are describing a pattern or uh, asked to use the data, please use numbers. Uh, use numbers. Um, it, it's going to back it up and use the numbers from the chart, the table, the graph. And so that's important to know with this data analysis FRQ, refer to specific numbers uh, and points in that data whenever you can. It will make your argument that much stronger uh, and help ensure that you get full credit uh, on data analysis questions. When um, you are asked to connect uh, the data to a course concept, like in this case, the concept of democratic consolidation, make sure you not only connect to the data, but that you show you understand that concept. Um, and there's some difference in opinion here on whether you should throw in a definition of the term or, you know, just show that you have an understanding of the term through the way you make the connections to the data. Uh, but talk to your teacher about what their preference is. I don't, I don't want to coach you in any way that goes against what they have taught you. But I do think it's really important to not just sort of use the term to show an understanding of what the term, and in this case, what democratic consolidation is in the way that you answer that question. And that might include giving a brief definition of it while connecting it to the data. Um, and then finally, uh, remember with explain, you've got to be answering why or how. And in this particular question, it was why. It would not be enough just to point out the differences in voter turnout rate between Nigeria and Mexico. You have to connect it the why, okay? Not only what the difference is, but the why is the important part. And anytime you see that task verb explain, you've got to even get into the why or the how of it, depending on what comes after that word explained. So I hope that's helpful uh, to get a little bit of feedback uh, from those of you that submitted. Those are just some common suggestions for improvement uh, that I saw. But we're ready now to get into our new topics for today. So I'm going to remind you that you have access to a Google Drive folder of resources. Uh, this is video two. So there are three documents that I have put into the folder for video two that you're welcome to access and use. Uh, if it is helpful to you, you can access it through the QR code. There's a URL link there for you, uh, or there is a link in the YouTube video description. So whichever method works best for you. But let's get into reviewing some of the most important unit one concepts now. So let's start with a couple of key vocabulary terms. Uh, we do need to make sure that in this course, we can define terms with accuracy and precision. Um, although, you know, we're not gonna have ID or definitions type stuff, but, uh, and if you are taking the digital exam, you'll see even less of that. It won't even be part of the prompts or the definition. But it, even if you're not having to write out an exact definition, you're not gonna be able to apply these concepts two course countries, which we will all have to do, regardless of what version of the exam uh, we're taking this year, if we don't have a accurate and precise understanding of what they mean. So the first two terms are things we talked about yesterday, and they are uh, big ideas, and we're going to keep coming back to those big ideas, uh, because that is what connects everything else in this class. So that idea of democratization, which is that transitioning from authoritarian to democratic regime. And we're going to spend a good bit of time today making sure we understand the differences between democratic and authoritarian regimes and looking at some of the indicators uh, that are part of that transition or that process of democratization. And then that term legitimacy, uh, when we're talking about legitimacy, we're talking about the degree to which uh, the citizenry accept a government's right to rule and use their power uh, the way they are using that power. And, and we talked about that yesterday, but that term, um, it, it comes up over and over again, and it'll, it'll relate to some of the other things we're going to talk about today as well. Now, I mentioned yesterday, uh, another one of the big ideas is power and authority. And I told you that uh, I wasn't going to get into that too much uh, yesterday because it would be part of what we're doing today. So here we are. Let's talk a little bit about the difference in power and authority. So power is referring to the ability to control or direct others. Okay, so someone's ability uh, to control or direct others uh, is power. Authority is the right, 
okay? So there are some times where a person or an institution might have both power and authority. There are some times where someone may have the authority under the constitution or governing documents or traditions of a country, but not much power, not ability. Or there could be times where someone has the power, but not the authority. Okay. So let me go through two examples. One, a non-government example, just to help us understand this concept. And then we'll talk through a government example of the difference between power and authority. So let me, let me give you a, a non-comparative government, although it does relate to a, a comparative government and class that I taught several years ago. So um, with this class, had a, had a great first period class, large group, about 36 students in the group, really bright group. And uh, I, as the teacher of that class, had the authority over that class. Okay. Uh, I had the right to sort of make decisions about the class, what we would do, how procedures would operate. As the teacher assigned to the class, those students uh, in my class, I had the authority. And uh, for most of the semester, they were a very good group. Uh, I also had power. Uh, I had the ability to control and direct them and uh, uh, not in an authoritarian manner, but uh, uh, the ability to have what uh, you know, direct the class and to get the students in the class to do as I requested and move through the course uh, in the way as I instructed them. But I have a, um, a, 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 I guess now fond recollection of one morning about a week before the exam. And you know how teachers get when it gets crunch time, uh, right before an AP exam, we get a little stressed. We don't like to waste class time. Uh, we got a lot to do. We want you to be ready. And I was in that mode that a week before the exam that year, first period class. I had hall duty that morning. So the class had come into the room and I was not in the room. Uh, and uh, as I'm turning the corner to enter my class, right as the bell's ringing to start first period, uh, I, I smell something cooking. And I walk into my room and my class is making waffles. They brought in portable waffle makers. They have set up a whole side of the room with toppings for waffles, variety of toppings. Uh, and I walk in and I said, what is going on? I said, oh, we decided we've been working too hard. We needed a waffle break. So without asking, uh, without uh, me using my power to grant permission, they had taken the power and they had organized it. Uh, they had organized it. Did they have the authority to do so? Absolutely not. But that particular day, they had the power because they knew what was I going to do? Uh, you know, what was I going to do? The waffles were cooking. There we were. Uh, so we ate some waffles and then we got down to reviewing and uh, they still did pretty well on the exam. So I'm not I'm not angry about it. But that's an example of I had the authority, but that day they clearly had the power. They were in control. They organized it. They directed it. And I ended up having to sort of follow along despite uh, me having the accepted or legitimized uh, uh, authority over that class. So there is a non government related but let's talk about an example related to one of our course countries. And I've got to give credit. Uh, somebody who submitted the Google form put this example in their Google form, asked if this was a good example. And it's a great example. So I'm going to use your example uh, from uh, uh, one of your fellow peers that's going to be taking this exam, asked in the Google form um, if an example of the difference in power and authority from Iran would be this. And so this was the example that student shared and said, so the example of authority, uh, according uh, to the Constitution uh, of 1979, grants authority uh, to the president and to the supreme leader uh, and to the modules. Different, you know, the, the right to control others and direct orders others is granted to some of those democratic uh, institutions as well as some of the theocratic institutions. And that's exactly right. Okay, uh, that authority is, is uh, coming from the 1979 Constitution and it is vested in both some democratic and some theocratic sides of government. So that's a good example of authority from Iran. But this student said, uh, however, the power, if you really have understood the power structure, you understand that the person that really has the ability to control others uh, and sort of has the final word on most uh, decisions uh, is going to be the supreme leader. 
And so the student said, so would that be correct to say that there are several different institutions that have authority, but the person with the real power would be the supreme leader? And that's a great example. Couldn't have come up with a better one myself. So thanks for sharing that example. And hopefully that helps you understand uh, some of those differences. All right, so now let's get into these terms. These are some of the most challenging uh, to me because we often hear these terms used interchangeably for one another. And uh, I have to admit, I even make that mistake from time to time. We'll use one when what I really mean is one of the other uh, because they're similar, but there are significant and important differences. And so let's make sure we understand those differences. So first off, uh, we talk about nation. Okay. Nation is referring to a people with some sort of commonality. Uh, it could be race, it could be language, it could be religion, ethnicity, and or political identity. It could be one or more of those things, but there's some sort of shared culture, race, language, religion, or ethnicity. They may or may not have a common state regime or government. Um, and so that's important to note. I think that one maybe is a little bit uh, easier to distinguish than these other three we're about to talk about, okay? So a state is referring to a political organization, not sort of a cultural identity, but a political organization uh, that involves uh, a permanent population and a defined territory uh, and institutions that control that population and define territory, and normally some sort of international recognition of sovereignty uh, for that uh, political organization with the defined territory uh, and control over a population, okay? Now, a regime refers to sort of the pattern of organization, the overarching system or rules uh, that control access to political power, all right? Uh, and typically we talk about regime as either being a more democratic leaning regime or a more authoritarian leaning regime. And we're gonna go into that in, a, in just a moment, differences between democratic and authoritarian regimes. And the important thing to remember is that a regime endures even when there are changes in government. Uh, and we'll talk now about what then is a government. So when we talk about a government, we're talking about the set of institutions or and or individuals uh, that are legally empowered to make binding decisions for a state. So we could be talking about individual leaders like a president or a prime minister of a country or institutions like a legislative branch, like parliament uh, in the UK or the Duma uh, in Russia, okay? Uh, so those terms can, can be a bit challenging to distinguish the difference, but we do need to understand those differences. And so uh, let me test you a little bit, uh, especially with distinguishing the difference between a regime and a government. So I'm gonna give you some, some uh, changes that have occurred either in regime or government in uh, our countries. And I want you to think to yourself, would this be an example of a regime change or a government change, a change in regime or a change in government? So first example I want you to think about, I want you to think about uh, the fairly recent change uh, going from Theresa May as the prime minister to Boris Johnson as the prime minister of the UK. What do you think? Is that a regime change or a government change? That would be a change in government, okay? It didn't change the UK from a democratic regime, still a democratic regime, just a change in the individuals in that leadership position of prime minister. So that's a change in government. And we see that the regime uh, endures through that change of government. And even in times where there's been a change in the party in power, now that was not a change in party, uh, that was both conservatives, but uh, even times when there has been a change in party from labor to conservative, uh, it's still not a regime change. Okay? It's still a change in government there. All right, what about if we talk about the uh, change, the implementation of the 1993 constitution in Russia? Would that be a regime change or a government change? Uh, 
that's going to be more of a regime change because we're talking about a dramatic change uh, from more authoritarian rule to a more democratic style of government. So that fits, that's a change in the pattern of organization, the overall uh, arching system of how the country is going to operate and work. Uh, what about um, if we look at the uh, 2018 election of AMLO in Mexico? Is that a change in regime or a change in government? It is a new party coming to power, but still the same overall system of government. So that's going to be uh, a, a system pattern of organization. So that's going to be a change in government, a new individual, a new party coming to power, um, but not a change from authoritarian to democratic or democratic to authoritarian. Uh, and then um, finally there, uh, one last example, uh, a switch from a parliamentary to a presidential system, uh, switch from a parliamentary to a presidential system in Nigeria. We're talking about when Nigeria switched from a parliamentary system to a presidential system. I think this one might be the most tricky. That's going to be also a change in government because it's both democratic systems, different ways of organizing the institutions. We're not talking about a change in leader. We're talking about changing the relationship between the legislative and executive systems of government, but uh, it's still democratic regime. Um, so that would be considered a change in government. So hopefully that gives you some course specific examples and helps you understand that important concept of the difference between regime and government. Now, I told you we'd talk more about democratic and authoritarian regimes, and we're going to do that now. Um, I think we probably by now you understand the difference between a democratic and authoritarian regime. It's about who holds the power, uh, who holds the power in the country. Uh, in a democratic regime, the power lies with the people. In an authoritarian regime, the power is invested in a small group who exercise power over the state, uh, and they're not held constitutionally responsible to the people. So. Uh, as I mentioned yesterday, when we talk about democratic and authoritarian regimes, we need to think about it on a spectrum uh, of, of you know, moving towards democratic or moving towards authoritarian. And there are some key factors that can help us determine how democratic or authoritarian uh, any of our six countries are. And these are some factors that you should be familiar with. Uh, the first factor is the principle that a state should be governed by law and not arbitrary decisions made by individual government officials. Uh, so the expectation that there is some sort of rule of law, some consistently applied laws that apply to all citizens, not rule by law. And that rule by law would be when there is um, the law is, is used as sort of uh, manipulated by those in power to silence opposition uh, and impose their will uh, and, and increase their own power. Uh, so democratic regimes are going to have more rule of law and authoritarian regimes more rule by law. The second thing, the degree of state influence or control over the media. A democratic regime is going to have much more freedom of the press and much less censorship, while an authoritarian regime is going to see a whole lot more control uh, of the media and censorship of the media, including uh, social media. Okay. Uh, the third one is the degree and practice of free and fair elections. A democratic regime is going to have much more uh, free and fair elections, uh, and there's often going to be protections in place to secure those, uh, like uh, independent agencies, uh, like the uh, IFE to ensure uh, the free and fair elections. Uh, and an authoritarian regime often has elections, but those elections are not free, they're not fair, they're not often competitive, okay? Uh, the next factor is the degree of transparency or governmental decision-making. Uh, a democratic regime is going to have a lot more transparency. Remember that term transparency means openness. It means the citizens can see, the citizens have access to view and see how decisions are made. Uh, and in a democratic regime, we see that. In an authoritarian regime, we don't. Uh, so for example, think 
uh, in, in the UK. Think about prime minister's questions. Uh, that's, that's transparency, that's openness. It can be viewed by the public. Um, and uh, that's an example that we would see in a democratic regime. And then finally, the nature of citizen participation. In a democratic regime, citizens are going to have a whole lot more opportunities to participate in government, a lot more avenues like civil society and interest groups uh, than they would have in an authoritarian regime. So those are some of the criteria that can help us determine whether a country is more democratic or authoritarian. So let's take some of this criteria and apply it to two of our course countries. Okay, so let's take a look at the UK and China. So uh, you've got this Venn diagram here kind of comparing the two. And in the middle, we've got some things that they have in common. They both have laws and legal systems, and they both have elections, at least at some level of government. Uh, we know that the, the local level, uh, we have the elections in China. But there are a lot of differences between these two countries. The UK has established rule of law. Where in China, uh, there is more rule by law, uh, where the law is used to support uh, the Chinese Communist Party and those in power. In the UK, there is a mostly free media and free press, uh, where in China, there is heavy censorship of the press uh, and social media and even the great firewall that you probably have talked about in your classes. In the UK, there are free and fair elections. In China, there are elections, uh, but only at more lower levels of government. And there are still restrictions on uh, who can run. Um, and there are, as we know, there are uh, some other parties that exist in China, but they are uh, dominated by the Chinese Communist Party. In the UK, there's very high transparency. Look, we just talked about uh, the citizens have access to what is going on in the House of Commons and even the weekly prime minister's questions as a method of transparency and accountability uh, for the government. But in China, there's very low transparency. Often the citizens uh, know very little about how decisions are made in the highest levels of the Chinese Communist Party. In the UK, we see relatively high rates of citizen participation, especially in civil society and interest groups uh, and in voting. And in China, uh, uh, participation is much limited, uh, fewer options for voting and uh, regulations on civil society. So we see that the UK meets the criteria of being a democratic regime and China meets the criteria of an authoritarian regime. So hopefully that helps with a couple of course specific examples to uh, work through that criteria, the factors that we just talked about. So the last major concept I wanna to review today before we put it all together and then looked at, look at a couple of sample multiple choice questions is to make sure we understand the difference between a federal system and a unitary system, okay? This is ways that we structure power and authority between regional governments and a central government, okay? So a federal system is a system where power is shared uh, between the, the central government and the subnational or regional governments. And that power that the regional governments have are uh, legitimate and constitutionally protected to some extent. And so three of our course countries, uh, according to their constitutions, are federal system, Mexico, Nigeria, and Russia, all right? Now, a unitary system is a system where the power uh, is all in the central government. Now, common misconception, and I normally very early on when I teach this course, I have students that like to say, well, if it's a unitary system, well, they don't have regional governments or subnational units of governments. That's not true. Okay? Unitary systems do have subnational units of government. The difference is those subnational governments have no constitutionally vested power, no protected power. Uh, not, not, and, or not the authority, at least, to use that power. Maybe that's a better way to say it uh, more accurately. And the UK, China, and Iran are unitary systems. And there are some advantages and disadvantages to each of these. And I've put this chart in uh, your Google folder, so you can review that. I'm not going to spend too much time uh, going over this today. Uh, but I, I do want to point out one more thing about federal and unitary systems, because some of you may be saying, 
I think Miss Knight might be getting some of this wrong because my teacher taught me that in Russia, Vladimir Putin has been taking a lot of power away from regional governments and regional governors. And you're absolutely right. Your teacher is correct in that. And it's good that as I was just planning, explaining federal system, if you said to yourself, I'm not sure Russia is federal. But here's the thing. Russia is still a federal system, uh, according to where the authority uh, is placed according to their constitution. But they're what we, we could call asymmetric federalism or unbalanced. And uh, you're not gonna see that term on the AP exam, but that's sort of a way to help you understand how Russia could still be technically federal when a lot of the power has been taken away from regional governors in recent years. So it's still technically federal because still according to the legitimate document, uh, there is power that is given to regional governments, uh, but it's lopsided right now. Uh, it's lopsided. More power has been taken over by the central government. So we could, we could think of that as sort of asymmetric or unbalanced federalism. Then you also may have been thinking, well, what about the UK? Uh, when we studied the UK, we talked about uh, devolution and how uh, the UK has been giving power to Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland and how they have so many had their own regional assemblies now. So does that mean they're a federal system? Well, that's a great question. But no, the UK is still a unitary system. Just because the central government has devolved or given power to regional governments doesn't mean that uh, those are not, um, it, it does not mean that um, they're now a federal system. They're what we could refer to as a devolved unitary system. Uh, as a devolved unitary system. So hopefully that helps clear that up. That's part of the fun of comparative government. There's so many nuances uh, for each and every country that we study. So hopefully that helps clear that up. Now to finish our review of these important unit one topics, I put together sort of a uh, a chart that uh, my students have said is very helpful to them. Um, and so I wanted to share it with all of you in case it helps you sort of put all of those concepts that we just talked about together into uh, one place. So I sort of organized it by state regime and government. And when we talk about state, a state can be organized in unitary or federal, which we just talked about. And then we can also talk about how strong a state is based on are they able to implement policy over a defined territory uh, with sovereignty, without intervention uh, from outside or internal forces. So that's how we can sort of organize our thinking about states. When we talk about regimes, we're talking about that pattern of organization. And as we just said, we're talking about either democratic or authoritarian regimes. We just went through that, the differences there. We also, under the category of democratic regime, we can break that up even further into liberal and illiberal democracies uh, based on sort of how far the country has moved towards democratic consolidation and have they moved to the point that there is rule of law and civil liberties and civil society and a neutral judiciary and all those other good things that can go along with democracy? Or are they more still in the illiberal or procedural democracy where the process of elections, competitive regular elections is developed and work is still being done to develop all those other things? And then finally, when we're talking about government, we're talking about the individuals and institutions that are in power. We can talk about the way we organize the executive branch. Is it a single executive uh, like what we see uh, in Mexico or is it a dual executive like what we see in the UK? Uh, and then we can also talk about the relationship between the executive and legislative branches. Is it uh, a presidential system with separate uh, and distinct branches or a parliamentary system with fused branches? And Ms. Bailey is going to explore that, uh, the differences between presidential and parliamentary, more with you in tomorrow's session. So you'll get more elaboration there if you have questions in that last box. Um, so there's the important things. I hope this chart helps you put it up together. And let's use our remaining time today to go through a couple of practice multiple choice questions uh, that are stimulus based. We'll do one data, um, one, and then one um, text based one to finish up our time together today. 
So here is a practice quantitative multiple choice. Uh, remember our advice from yesterday that you should always sort of read everything around the data set, uh, look at the, if there's any sort of key or legend or title, uh, so look at the, um, each access to see what's being measured. So I encourage you always to do that first, then read the question and the answer choices uh, and um, see what is the best answer. You may need a little more time to read through this question, so I would encourage you if you do need that time, hit pause, because I'm going to move forward uh, and uh, go ahead and move to the correct answer. So pause right now if you don't want to see the correct answer yet. Correct answer here is A. The question was asking a political scientist investigating the relationship between birth rate and the number of women in parliament compiles data into the bar graph shown below. We see that the uh, lighter uh, bar is percent of women in the lower or single house of parliament. And then the darker bar is the birth rate. What you would need to do here is sort of go through each of the possible answers and see which one is backed up fully by the data. And if you do that, the only one that is backed up fully uh, is A. Mexico, the United Kingdom, and China have the highest percentage of women in parliament. That's that lighter bar. And you can see uh, that those three countries do have the greatest percentage of women in parliament. All of the others, uh, either all of the statement is false or one part of it is false based on the data. Uh, so. Um, you, you can see that one. To me, that's a pretty straightforward, uh, straightforward multiple choice question there. Now let's look at a qualitative question. Um, these are just some steps. We use these in our AP Daily videos talking about source analysis, just some steps to think through. Um, I know that annotating isn't going to be a possibility on uh, that digital exam, but you can still sort of make mental notes and make connections. But these are some steps that you can think through anytime you're approaching really any text. It doesn't just have to be on the AP exam of sort of some steps. Look at the title, the author, publication information, read the passage, uh, annotate by either making mental notes or actually writing it down, identify the author's claims and evidence, uh, and then relate it to your course content. So uh, here's a little practice for you. Um, this is a uh, short text and uh, there are two questions that go along with it. So this is similar to what you might see where there'd be one uh, source and uh, a couple of questions that go along with that source. So uh, same thing I'm going to say from just a minute ago, I would recommend that you, um, you pause if you need some time to read through and determine the answers, because for the sake of time, I'm going to move forward and help explain the answer now. Um, so pause if you don't want to see that answer. All right, so what I have done, uh, the, the correct answers are highlighted, um, but I've sort of marked on it. Let me tell you kind of what I was thinking as I would approach this. Where you see that I have marked in purple, that's what I marked first. And that's where I was just trying to circle or underline clues of, of what this was really about, of things that I knew that connected to this. So I see Iran's revolution. I see the date, 2018, and I'm starting to think, okay, what was going on in 2018? Social uprising, hybrid momentum, green movement, previous protests, Arab uprising. So I'm, I'm trying to see, okay, get a picture of what is the, the main topic of this, all right? Then where you see where I've sort of underlined in blue, that's where I was able to pull the information to help me answer the first multiple choice question there. And where you see the green underlined, that's where I was able to pull the information to help me answer the second question there. Um, so just sort of wanted to kind of help you and, and everybody will think through things a little, a little bit differently, uh, but let you see sort of kind of strategically how I would approach these. And again, you, you may not have the time to write, or you might be taking a format where you don't really have the ability to annotate, but you can still sort of mentally think through this, you know, what are the clues that are going to give me some context and help me relate this to what I've learned about, in this case, Iran, uh, and then where am I finding the information? That first question was asking about the main idea. And a lot of times we assume we're going to see the main idea right at the beginning, but that wasn't the case. That doesn't come in until, you know, it's a pretty short little, little passage uh, where we get into the, the main idea that there are these demands and the government could 
uh, address some of these demands, but it's not likely they're going to, so protests are going to continue. And then the second question asks, so what are the implications uh, to that, the main point of this argue? And the implications are that um, Iran's likely to have increased political instability and see more protests like the ones they saw uh, in uh, 2018. So uh, there's, there's a practice question. If you would like to work with this practice question, it is also in the Google Drive folder that you have access to. So what should we take away as we're wrapping this up for today's session? Uh, well, hopefully you're a little more comfortable with the vocabulary of regime uh, and state uh, and nation and government, feel a little bit better about those, as well as continuing to understand how legitimacy and democratization are woven throughout the course. And uh, now maybe you feel a little bit about, better about that source analysis, uh, uh, multiple choice questions that you'll see a couple of on the AP exam. Uh, please give me some feedback. Ms. Bailey and I would love to get some feedback, uh, whatever questions you may have, uh, what you would like to see us focus on in our future sessions. We want to make this as, meaning for you, as meaningful for you as we possibly can, and we're grateful for the feedback you've provided so far. If you would like a shout out to your class, uh, please submit that via that form too, and we'll try to uh, give a shout out to your class in the future. I thank you so much for joining me for session two. I hope you found it helpful. Tomorrow, uh, you're going to get to meet Mrs. Bailey uh, and get to learn from her. Uh, she's got a great session prepared for you on unit two, where she's going to focus on the institutions. And you're going to get some practice with some concept application FRQs. So those of you that were asking for more practice FRQs, tune in tomorrow. You're going to get the opportunity to do that. Mrs. Bailey will be with you the next two days. And then I'll look forward to being back with you next Monday and Tuesday. Thanks so much.